a moderator for this panel. We had, um, in May, we had the precinct project where all of us gathered on pre at precincts um, where we vote and we elected chairman for our precincts to go to the county conventions for that afternoon. Wait a minute, that was April 27th, wasn't it? Four. 23rd, 23rd. The last, next to the last Saturday of April. Then on May 14th was the state convention. Uh, when the state convention was held here in Jackson at the Hilton on County Line Road, uh, there were some interesting things that happened that needed to be revealed. And those of you who don't know about the precinct project, please see Ross afterwards because this is going to be an ongoing project for the next four years. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about Ross. Ross is a, a graduate of Mississippi State University in political science. She was former staff of Governor Fordyce. He taught high school social studies for five years. Uh, and he worked for State Auditor Phil Bryant for three years. What year was that? Uh, 2004, 2005. 2000, about 2004, He's, he's been a political activist for 36 years. If you could call him, if you could call him establishment, he's probably the farthest right of anybody who could call the GOP establishment. I hope that's not a, a slam. <laughs> uh, he was a GOP chairman, county chairman, for Reagan and Bush in 1984. He was a youth staff delegate and alternate delegate to four state GOP conventions. Uh, he's volunteer and absentee ballot director for numerous campaigns. He's former alderman in the town of West Mississippi, and he's currently on the board of the Central Mississippi Tea Party, and he's driving us hard in the Central Tea Party. What is a vexo vexolo vexologist? Studier of flags. Study flags. I learned something today. He loves duck hunting and Mississippi State University baseball. Ross Aldrich. Thank you, Ms. Paul. Thank you. Yes, uh, I love the Tea Party and Mississippi and America more, or I would be in Starkville right now watching uh, my Mississippi Superior University Bulldogs, uh, hopefully getting ready to beat uh, Arizona today since they did not yesterday. Uh, it's good to be here with y'all, uh, my fellow lovers of liberty. Uh, our crowd is a little uh, diminished, I'm sorry to say, but there's a lot of passion in this room and folks who care about the right things. Uh, I know that for a fact because most of you I have seen before or stood uh, beside in the fight for liberty on various uh, and sundry uh, topics, uh, of which is why I'm here. As you can see, we have an illustrious panel uh, to your right. Uh, and we're going to discuss what just happened in the latter part of April regarding uh, the county, district, and state Republican Party election of its leadership. Now, before I go any further, how many of you in this room participated in your county, your precinct, your county, your district, and or the state convention? If you had any part in it whatsoever, raise your hand. All right, very good. That is the majority of you. All right, the idea behind all of this was to reform our state Republican leadership and uh, the state Republican Party as a whole. Uh, if you go back a couple of years, uh, they're working on focusing. Uh, if you go back a couple of years, you'll remember a, a little Senate race that got national attention. That Senate race was between uh, the Honorable Chris McDaniel and his opponent, Senator Cochran. Well, the conservative won the primary, that being Senator McDaniel, uh, but the establishment non-conservative uh, <clears throat> won overall. Now, many of us were disappointed. We're also disappointed in how the Republican Party and Republican leadership treated the situation and has treated the conservative side of things for many, many years. Now, the idea was, thanks to Ms. Melanie Sojourner and Chris and some others, hey, if we're going to get the party to wake up, listen, and do right, we've got to pull it to the right. And the way to do that is to get y'all involved and elected at your precinct, at your county, 
as delegates to the state convention and maybe on the state executive committee. Those are the goals. We started a little bit late, so we didn't win in a lot of places. Now, I am from Rankin County, as a few others are, and we <coughs> took the brunt of getting slapped upside the head, so to speak, by the establishment. We lost, and we lost big, but we were hurt. Isn't that right, Ms. Sherry? Attempts were made, we got together as quick as we could, um, weeks in advance, and we learned how the process worked, all right? And that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit here today. Now the folks here on the panel are gonna tell you what happened in their district meeting, hopefully a little bit about what happened in their counties. I'd like that too, we've only got 30 minutes, folks, so it's gonna be a little tight. But as a general overview, many people in this state do not understand that for there to be a Republican primary, there has to be a county leadership to run those primaries. Do you hear me? There must be a county executive committee. So there could be Republicans on the ballot for you to vote for in primaries, when there's nothing but Republicans. You do not register as a Republican. We are not a closed primary state, which we're very well aware of after the Cochran McDaniel race. Hmm. Uh, so, on that uh, Saturday in April, you had to be at your precinct and get elected as a delegate from your precinct to go to the county convention that afternoon where you voted on your county leadership, county Republican leadership. Well, the problem arose, as it's been done over years and years, it didn't matter. Now, I'm going to be blunt, okay? The establishment, if they controlled it like they did in Rankin County, uh, as Miss Melanie knows all too well, they already had it set up the way they want. They had it set up the way they wanted it run. And I'm speaking from Rankin County. All these great conservative, new blood, grassroots folks. How many times have you heard that word grassroots today? Grassroots, conservative, caring people were there. They were delegates. And in Rankin County, the ruling establishment oligarchy wouldn't even hear motions because you needed to know a little bit about parliamentary procedure. Okay, you needed to know Robert's rules. Motions, people stood up. Great, <laughs> strong, conservative. Paul's here, he was one of them. People who weren't scared stand up. Motion, Mr. Chairman. Paul got recognized once. The chairman, Gary Harkins, and by the way, anything I say today, you can quote me on. <laughs> Being the dictator of our so-called elected this uh, Republican Executive Committee, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't even hear Paul. He got right up in his face and grimacing in, in Paul's face to let him know he didn't appreciate Paul doing exactly what the process called for. Being there, being an elected delegate, making motions to nominate, nominate people for the uh, Executive Committee and for chairmanship. No, they didn't want that. They wanted a railroad and they got it in Rankin County. Now, it happened in other counties, too. We didn't have the votes. We didn't have enough conservative votes in Rankin County to overturn the county leadership. But we didn't even get to nominate. Motions were not heard. Motions to suspend the rules. Motion, for, uh, moving the previous question. If it was a motion to nominate, you could forget it. He ignored it. And then he, uh, he would turn and say, oh, I understand we've got a motion to adjourn over here. No, he didn't. He just already had it pre-established that that's the way it was going to be done. There wasn't a motion made. He didn't recognize uh, that individual. It was predetermined. Do you hear me? It was predetermined. I studied communism and the way the Politburo and these big people's conferences work in, China, in communist China and communist Russia. Guess what? Almost parallel. That's the way they ran the show. Now I'm going to let the folks who attended the state convention tell you how it happened there. They were a little nicer about it. They weren't nice in Rankin County. But it's almost just as bad. Now folks, just a few months prior to what just happened, we tried to organize and do and get our, our conservatives elected to our county parties and to state leadership. And we didn't get it done in time. Now we're starting again. And we've got four years. You hear me? Four years to plan to do this right. All right? On the 
the panel gets through, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we need to do to start planning to do that in four years from now, and Miss Melanie probably will too. So, without further ado, you give somebody like me a microphone, I'm usually a little bashful about it, so. Uh, we have here from uh, District 1, and what I'm going to do, folks, is I'm going to uh, tell you who's from District 1, let them tell you a little bit about themselves and what they experienced in their district in trying to get elected and what they experienced at the state Republican Convention. All right, from District 1, we've got Ms. Pat, Counselor Pat, Nostinit, mm, I butchered that one. Yes, you did. Yes. Please say your last name correctly. Nozinich. Nozinich. There we go. Counselor Pat Nozinich is from the... Thank you very much. Uh, is from the first district. She's from Tate County. She is an outstanding attorney and outstanding parliamentarian uh, also, and uh, made a presentation at a meeting that we had just a few weeks ago at Holiday Inn. Uh, is well versed in what happened in the first. And Miss Pat, if you would tell us your experience very quickly. Hello, I'm not shy either. As are we on, we on? We are now. And I am not shy. I uh, just thought I'd go ahead and warn you. Um, I am Pat Nozinich. I'm from Tate County, uh, the new uh, VP of the ex uh, County Executive Board. But I must tell you, in Tate County, we didn't have a whole lot of trouble because we don't have a strong party there. So uh, we've just sort of taken over and uh, gone out and uh, tried to build a grassroots effort. So we did not have difficulty in Tate County, I'm grateful to say, and I look forward to having uh, more folks come become involved in our uh, county as they uh, move forward for the next four years. Uh, I do want to mention DeSoto, which is up north of us. DeSoto did have a struggle, worked very hard to get uh, conservatives ready to be precinct captains from all of their 40 precincts, and they got quite a number done. Uh, but then I think had some people persuaded to either not show up or go the other way by the powers that be, the establishment. So they ended up splitting their delegates uh, out of the 16. They had eight that were conservatives and eight that would be considered pro-establishment. Um, I do not know how the other counties went in terms of the difficulties that they had, but I do know that we had a lot of people quite excited in the first district uh, to try to make inroads at the state convention. I am sad to report that in spite of our efforts, we were not successful. I do believe that, uh, at least in the first district, they saw us coming. Uh, they had the uh, party parliamentarian there, as well as the chair of the uh, Rules and Bylaws Committee, uh, to shut us down quite uh, rapidly. We did attempt to introduce a motion to dissolve the caucus into a committee as a whole to try to uh, bring the nominating process for the uh, uh, state executive committee and the uh, three delegates to the national convention to uh, the floor for consideration and additional nominations. We were not able to even get out of the gate with that motion. We were unable to appeal the decision of the chair. And uh, according to Mr. Brad White, who's their chair of their bylaws and uh, rules committee, uh, when we voted to approve the rules, we voted to remove any possibility of addressing the nomination process uh, in the district caucuses. To that end, um, we, uh, we had several votes uh, take place to try to uh, get our point of view across and open up the floor. All were defeated. We did call for standing votes, division votes. We had to vote a couple of times because apparently more people were in there to vote than actually were a number of delegates allocated to us. Uh, that continued until the very last vote and I uh, was then told it didn't matter because they won anyway. <laughs> so. Thank you. I know. I thought that was a lot. Um, what I have done in response to that, and, and some of you will get uh, copies of these or if you've not already, um, my position now is to go back through and begin to try to uh, create modifications of the rules and the bylaws. And uh, so I've taken it upon myself to create a draft that is roaming around for feedback. Welcome the feedback, please. Uh, I'm hoping that we can come up with a final draft of revisions that we can then present to our state executive committee that ostensibly wants to have participation 
and see if they will not adopt these changes and modifications between now and the next convention. Uh, if not, and I'm not actually holding my breath to see that they do this, assuming that they don't adopt any of these or very few of these, um, that gives us four years to get this information out and about to other participants. And I am hoping by the next convention, people will be mad as I'll get out and ready to come in and fight that much harder. If we can't get the state executive party's attention now, then uh, we'll just have to build a stronger uh, opposition for the next convention. Okay. Questions? We're going to hold Q&A to the end. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Pat. <clears throat> oh, boy. Uh, you really like to put me on the spot. To, uh, I, I, Ms. Pat, and I'll let her spell the last name. N-O-Z-I-N-I-C-H. Yeah, I'm married into it. What can I say? <laughs> N-O-S-Z-I-N-C-H? N-O-Z-I-N-I-C-H. That's okay. Most of my family cannot say it or spell it, and I've been married for almost 41 years. <laughs> All right. For our second district, uh, we've got uh, Mr. Mark Glidewell, and Mark is from Panola County, uh, and I'm guessing outside of Batesville, you've got to be on the west side is in the second district, the flatland part of it. So tell us a little bit about uh, what you encountered, uh, Mr. Mark. Well, in Panola County, it was a lot like uh, like Tate. Uh, we didn't have a big a big fight on our hands because we didn't have a strong Republican executive committee there. Uh, it was failing. This is uh, this is something that that we see all across the state, though. There's only so many counties that make up the numbers so that the math can fall towards the establishment side of this argument. So that's all they focus on. We have a golden opportunity here in the next four years to set up Republican parties in all these counties like Panola that was barely hanging by a thread. Some counties have none. Of course, you're looking at, at just a few, uh, a few votes, like Panola County gets three. We managed to go in there with uh, someone said we didn't have a whole lot of time to do this or we didn't dedicate a whole lot of time until it was kind of at the last minute, but we still managed to come away with non-establishment people as our executive chairman, vice chairman, and at least half of our executive committee now, actually a little over half, is all non-establishment. So we had a, very, a, a big victory in my eyes in Panola County, and we'll work harder you know, in the next four years to get the word out to people that this is a part of the voting process. We've never been told about it. I didn't know anything about it. I've voted since the day I was old enough to vote. But until this came around and we started talking about it and got involved, I had no idea that this went on every four years. And they don't want that knowledge to get out because the old guard can keep their power and their position just so long as we don't show up and take part in the process. So we do have four years now to get the word out and to make something happen. We scared the crap out of them this time. I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't believe ever in the history of this has all, I don't think any has been challenged, have they? Not like this. We challenged all four. All four districts were challenged. That's awesome. Mark, tell them a little we, bit about the time being what it is, a little bit about what happened at the district caucus. We, uh, when they closed the door, until they closed the door, all we talked about was unity in the party. As soon as the door closed, that was over. When we went into our caucuses, uh, like them, uh, Bill Marcy, and most of y'all probably know Bill Marcy, he's a pretty vocal fella. He was, he was our captain, our chairman, our spokesperson, put it that way. He got up and made a motion to, uh, so that we could uh, make it a committee and discuss the, the names, the, the, who was nominated, because they just give you the slate up or down, period. That's all we wanted to do. Let's talk about this for just a minute. Uh, we don't even know these names. We haven't heard them yet. Let's listen to them. They had a parliamentarian there, and she was there for one reason and one reason only, to back up the chairman. Whatever he said, she would say, yes, that's right. Uh, 
you want to use Robert's Rules of Order, which we tried to do. And the only time that applies is when it's in their favor. When it's not in their favor, oh, well, we use other rules for that. And you voted on them, even though we didn't tell you what they were. Uh, so Bill Marcy makes the motion anyway. We, uh, we vote, voice vote. They automatically say, well, we won. You know, so we cried division once they actually gave us uh, uh, a count, a standing count, once they did not even denied us that, which is out of order. And um, Bill kept insisting. And as he did, it, I mean, he, he, it didn't take very long. He didn't raise his voice. The room got kind of loud, so Bill was talking loud so that everyone in the back of the room could hear him. If you know Bill, you know he's got a loud commanding voice to start with. He wasn't causing trouble. He was just trying to make a motion. Uh, the next thing you know, they bring this state trooper in that's bigger than Bill, if you can believe that. And uh, he gets all up in Bill's face and lets him know if you don't shut up and you don't shut up right now and let them do what they're going to do, then I'm going to haul you out of here. Well, back and forth a little bit and Bill was very respectful to the officer and uh, eventually the situation calmed down a little bit. But uh, obviously we lost. We didn't have the numbers, but we were there and we were in the fight. And that's the important part. Next time around, we will have the numbers. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, and I heard the story uh, for all y'all about Bill Marcy. Y'all asked him about what happened about that trooper getting in his face and intimidating him, or trying to intimidate him. Uh, the idea that that even happened is an insult. Yes. Uh, and almost criminal, if you ask me, that they think they can do that. If you would, sir, please, put the perspective. We hold the Q&A until afterward, but I want to make sure all the panelists get to speak. Uh, but y'all asked Bill about that, if you've seen. All right, uh, moving on very quickly. Uh, here representing District 3 is the grand lady from Adams County, Miss Melanie Sojourner. And Melanie and I have worked uh, shoulder to shoulder on this thing a great deal over the last many months. And I've stayed mainly in the metro area. I only ventured out a couple of times, but Miss Melanie has uh, traveled the whole state and has been pretty much the main leader behind uh, this effort and will remain so, as far as I know, uh, working on this for the next few years. Uh, and bless her heart, she's got a lot to do and has sacrificed a lot of her own time, time away from the family, and uh, left a lot of rubber on the road uh, and gas fumes too, traveling back and forth as she's done. So Ms. Melanie, tell us uh, uh, excuse me, a little bit about uh, District 3 and what we're trying to do as a whole for the future. The, the fiasco from my perspective, so to speak. Um, first of all, thank you, Ross. You're way too kind. Um, it's been an honor to work with all of y'all and everyone on this panel and I look around the room. People who have put so much time and effort into this, and I'm so thankful. And, you know, we talked about this a little bit before. I mean, this became known to us after 2014, what they had done. We knew we had to do something. And, you know, I mark it on a really good point. I cannot tell you guys, as, as I traveled around the state, there are Republican elected officials all over this state who will say, caucus? We don't caucus in Mississippi. That's what they do in Iowa. They have no idea. And, but that's been by design, because if, they don't, if you don't know, then you don't participate, and they get to do what they want to do. And our goal is to change that. It's just to empower the people. Um, I had Joe Nossif get right up, and, and Pete Perry, and Pete Perry debated me for a long time saying, but you said you're going to take down the party. I said, Pete, if you've showed up at any meetings I've done for the past year, I have said that our goal is to not take down the party or destroy the party. Our goal is to empower the people to lead the party. And that's not what has been allowed to have been done. So from my county, I live in Adams, which is in the southwest corner. We are not a Republican stronghold. The county voted for the first Republican primary in history a few months ago. I was the first ever elected Republican from that county, so it's not a Republican stronghold. However, between our previous chairman and her husband and one other lady, they have held almost 40 years combined of Haley Barber government appointments. They do whatever he wants. They fight tooth and nail for whatever he wants. And between those three people, they were really leading you'll love this, both the Kasich and Christie charge in Mississippi. 
So, um, after, after my Senate re-election bid that went down the way it did, my father was as motivated and inspired to do anything in his life the way he was this. So, we, un we lived in an area where we had a very strong Republican Party. However, they had no idea what my dad and some of my big supporters from my Senate race were planning to do. Uh, in most of the 19 precincts in our county, we had about 20 people show up, which is unheard of. Um, and so when we got into the courthouse that afternoon to do our precinct, they, they had all their ducks in a row, Ross. They were planning on doing it the Gary Harkins way, but we outnumbered them about four to one. So that's the way it has to work to be successful. The, it's a numbers game, it's not a money game, it's the only way we can beat them now. So we did in my county, and there were several, as a matter of fact, all four counties that fall into the Senate district that I held, we did the exact same thing in. So I'm really proud of those, um, of those counties. In our congressional caucus at the state convention, um, I had in, my, in, in our caucus, we had Pete Perry, Austin Barber, Gary Harkins, um, oh gosh, there's a, a lot of those power players within the party. Um, fall into that congressional district. And I, I will say their, their chairman was respectful, but we had a group of people that pushed back as hard as they tried to push toward us. And so we were able to move a number of motions and push a number of votes like the others, we didn't have it. I can tell you that in most congressional districts, there are 68 to 70 delegates per district. On average, we had about 20 to 26, 27 votes out of the 68 or 69. So we had a little better than a third, um, which I think is really good, first time out of the gate. I will also tell you that even though we did not find success, there were a number of people from other counties who stood and waited to speak to me after it was over with, who said, thank you. We had no idea that there was someone out there that would raise these issues. If we had known, you know, I, I wanted to vote. When one, when one man did, he said, I did vote with you. I, I wasn't sure what I was voting for, but it just sounded like you wanted the people to raise their voices, and I have somebody I want on that committee. And so the, the moral here is, is that there are more people out there who support you and want to help. They just, they just have to know. I can also tell you that around the state, um, Ross, I have no doubt that we had more people show up than the establishment did around the state. The problem was is that they showed up and they didn't know what to do. And we tried really hard. We had a lot of meetings around the straight state, tried to get people involved. But still, this presidential election drove a lot of people out and th those people got outmaneuvered by the, by the establishment. So I truly believe that if we take what we started with this time, we keep the base involved, and over the course of the next four years, we continue to meet. I do believe that we can get enough people. And you know, it's just like at the end of the day, I'll tell you this and we'll pass it on to Phil. Both Austin and Henry Barber um, stood in the corner of a room over here while a bunch of concern, and they waited and waited. One of them waited for a very long time and said, Melanie, can I please speak to you for a moment? Roy, it's the first time either one of them you know, addressed me or spoke to me since 2014. And they said things to me, you know, thank you for, for being respectful. Um, you know, it, it really floored us that, that the people who came today and raised their, you know, voices that so many of them were respectful. I don't know who they thought we were. I don't know what kind of people they thought. I don't know what they expected from us. But they, they said this. I, love, I thought this was so interesting from Henry Barber, of all people. He said, Melanie... And I don't know if Russ Latino is still here, but, but Russ posted something on Facebook, and I want to have this conversation with him. Henry said, Melanie, we have to come together. What can we do to fix the party? I said, Henry, if you have to ask me that question, you don't understand. He said, I'm over 2014. I said, I'm not, and I'm not going to get over it. And I said, it has nothing to do with a race or two men individually. It has everything to do with the, with the practices that y'all used that weighed personality over policy. I said, we tried for months to run on policy and you wouldn't allow it. 
And so instead, you used personal tactics, the most despicable kind, and you stabbed the people in the back who make up the base of your party. They're not getting over it. We're not getting over it. I said, now, if you want to talk about running races on policy, and you want to talk about running races on the issues alone, then we may can have some conversations. But until then, we're going to go back to our home districts, and we're going to rally Republicans around the base and the platform of the party, and we'll see y'all in four years. Kind of left it at that. So I'm counting on y'all to help us do that. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Miller. By the way, um, be sure and hang around and talk to Melanie or me afterwards um, about this, because I want you to take these ideas and go home. We're giving you four years the system is giving you four years to rally uh, the folks in your home area because we've got people from all over the state here, okay? From Tate County to Hancock County, uh, DeSoto County, Lee. And it's going to take that long to start working that base up, so we will have the numbers four years from now, and you let Melanie know who they are, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But, and Ms. Sandra, keep me on uh, time. I left my watch down there. Okay. Uh, our last district, District 4, uh, is represented by Mr. Phil Hardy. Phil, tell us just a little bit about yourself and then what happened in the caucus. Certainly will, but uh, before I do that, I want to I want to make one comment on what uh, what Mr. Barber said to you, and uh, my response to that would be: it's a whole lot easier and quicker to get over something when you win by hook or by crook than it is when you've been defeated by underhanded tactics. Um, exactly. Uh, and I also want to say one thing about, uh, about this whole process. I think you know, the, the, the establishment of the party wants to, you know, they claim they want to, to, we've got to come together, we've got to unify, we have to have unity. I submit that the tactics that they're using are driving the party apart. It's those tactics that are driving the party apart. If they would listen, if they would be respectful, if they would have uh, allowed comments from the floor. At least allow people to have a voice, even if you get it outvoted. You had your say, but they will not do that. Uh, now, a little bit about me, uh, Phil Harding. Uh, you can probably tell from my uh, accent or lack thereof that uh, I did not grow up in uh, in South Mississippi on, on the coast. Uh, I am an Air Force uh, retiree. Uh, grew up in Ohio uh, and uh, spent 30 years in the Air Force. Retired out of Keesler in 2012. Uh, my involvement in politics up until 2012, 2013 was essentially voting. Uh, that's, that's about all you're allowed to do uh, in the military. So I uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't all that involved. Uh, you make a comment here and there to a friend. But I uh, did get involved in 2014 in the, uh, in the uh, Senate uh, uh, primaries and, uh, and, and was very disappointed in the outcome there. So, uh, of course, I wanted to be involved in the uh, precinct caucuses uh, this year. Uh, it was pretty easy in, uh, in my precinct. Uh, I took uh, two people with me, one, my wife and a good friend, and I uh, went to the uh, appointed place. And uh, my opponent, the, the temporary chair, was our county supervisor for our district. And she brought her husband and one friend. There was one other person showed up. They voted with me. So I, I became the, uh, the nominee to the county, uh, to the county convention. It was, it was that easy. It was not that easy in all of the precincts. Many of the precincts had uh, kind of record, uh, record turnout, uh, and, and it was record turnout for one of two reasons. Either the establishment saw them coming, or the, uh, the anti-establishment was, was well prepared. Uh, unfortunately, those where the anti-establishment groups were well prepared was, was few and far between, because when we got to the county uh, convention, uh, there were probably no more than uh, eight or 10 out of 62 precincts that were represented with someone who was even mildly uh, anti-establishment. Uh, there were probably 40 or so, uh, well over half, that were essentially clueless. They were just told where to be. Um, but uh, there was one objection to the uh, slate of officers and uh, slate of delegates. Uh, it was raised way too late to even be recognized, uh, but it was uh, very much the, the experience that everyone else had. It was a, a slate that was prepared in advance, which is in accordance with Robert's rules. I mean, we use that in other organizations. We prepare a slate of officers. The problem is, in these conventions, they don't allow discussion of it and they don't allow nominations from the floor. It's an up or down vote, uh, motion, uh, motion second, yay, 
nay, done, and it's that fast. You have to be prepared. You have to have the numbers. I, I know the two or three of you said it's a numbers game. It is absolutely a numbers game. We have to get the numbers in there in the precincts, and that takes all of those precincts so that we have enough folks in the county conventions to nominate, to, to raise the objection. It has to be overwhelmingly nay when they go to approve that, nay. And then you can go to a process where you can nominate from the floor. Same thing at state convention. Uh, it has to be overwhelming uh, that they cannot deny it. We have to have enough people on, in there, enough numbers to do that. And uh, I, I was not a delegate to the convention, but I did attend. And I stood outside the District 4 uh, District Caucus, and uh, I, I was actually quite embarrassed for, uh, for our party uh, at that time because when, uh, when the motions were raised, there was, there was actually raucous laughter coming out of the, 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 the caucus room. Uh, they were just laughing the, the person who raised the, uh, the motions down, and, and that's, just, that's just uncivilized, well, not uncivilized, but it's, it's, it's certainly not, uh, not the way we need to be behaving. So um, I, I think a, a good, solid effort, and I think it's something, uh, I, I approach this personally, I approach this as someone who's kind of a neophyte to this uh, coming in, uh, trying to figure out what's going on and uh, help me prepare for the next time around. And we, we have some work to do. We, we definitely have some work to do, but uh, it is, is certainly not something that we cannot do, that we cannot accomplish, and we need to. You know, Barry, that's good news, and I appreciate that. Uh, and to the whole panel, thank you. Folks, what we talked about happens every four years, but it must be worked on all in the meantime. And we conservatives are not the most pro-government people. So we kind of, many of us, or many of those we go to, to solicit to vote, really don't participate on a daily basis. They don't think about politics on a daily basis. I do, I admit it, every day I do something political. I either read, study, talk to somebody about an issue or whatnot. Because in a free society, if you want to remain free, you better exercise it, and you better have some educated folks voting, <laughs> or you're not gonna get a good result. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, with what Melanie's been doing in the precinct project, I'm going to bring something to your attention. Now, I found out about this a little bit after we started. I just bought a copy for Miss Melanie. The book is called Takeover, and it's, it's a good bit of history on what we've just discussed on what's happened between conservatism in the Republican Party and the Republican Party. Now, do you realize what I just did? I had to separate the term conservative from Republican Party. You know why? Because the Republican Party leadership is not conservative, okay? Ms. Moore mentioned that I've been doing this for 30 some odd years. I have since 1980. Couldn't even vote then. But in 84, I could. And I saw what was just described up here, the rubber stamping. But well, we were real small in Mississippi in the 80s. We're not so small anymore, all right? And the establishment, which is very moderate, still has control. And here we are, the conservative grassroots aspect. We are Mississippi. And we can't even get a conservative on hardly any boards and such. There are counties that have exceptions now, like this Pat and Tate County, thank God. All right? But we're not on the state executive committee. We sure don't have the chairmanship or the central committee. This book right here gives you a little history going back to Taft, really, Taft Eisenhower, and talking about how conservatives had not been winning and not in control of the party until Reagan. Reagan won because of the conservatism that, that grew from the Goldwater. Uh, era and growth, okay? But chapter 22 is what I want to point out to y'all. It breaks down what we've just been talking about here. It mentions two ways that conservatives are going to take over. One way is nominating, getting conservative candidates to run, and getting behind them. And then two, the precinct project. It is talked about right here in this book, especially chapter 22. It's Takeover by Richard Vigory. All right? I know about Richard Vigory because I studied the conservative movement back in 1980. I had this book from back then. Okay, the new right, we're ready to leave. Uh, please get this book, and there's a website that goes along with it. It's called, um, oh, my mind went blank. What's this there? I is mean, takeovergop.org. Takeovergop.org. Check that out. Uh, it's extremely good. Ladies and gentlemen, what we're doing here today, don't leave here and just forget about it. Okay, I'm asking you because. You need to think about what is conservative. We conservatives are not united. This lady sitting right over here, Miss Laura, this lady sitting in front of me, Miss Sandra, they did all this work. Roy did a lot of it when he was here. Agree to agree. 
we conservatives are not agreeing. As a friend of mine said about conservatism in Mississippi, it's a mile wide, but it's that deep. You stop and think about it. My philosophy on conservatism is very deep. These people right up here on this panel are passionately conservative. How many of you can stand up on this stage and describe what conservatism is? In God We Trust is on the bottom of that tax, uh, Mississippi Tea Party banner. Ms. Laura got up here in, in prayer. We're in a public place. And praise God, we can still praise Him and talk about it in prayer. Before I'm dead, I'm, I'm afraid that won't even be allowed anymore. Now you think about liberty in this country and how it came about because liberty is from God. And I know I'm getting on a speech. Don't let me run all the time. You better start fighting for it, folks. And if you want the, the ideas of liberty and conservatism to be in the Republican Party, you better get to work because it's just about gone. Mr. Castle probably would agree with me there. Amen, brother. I do. We've got, the third party's going to do well this year. Why? And look at the age group in this in this auditorium. I always do this. I used to be the youngest. I'm not quite anymore. I don't mind folks knowing my age so much because I don't look 51, do I, Miss Law? Thank you very much. I love my understanding. <laughs> We need 20-somethings in this room who think Bernie's a uh, great alternative and a great person to be president. Bolshevik Bernie for president. There you go. No. Folks, you've got to teach it to your children for them to have any future whatsoever. And, it's, and politics is not the only way to do it. The best way to save this country is right when that grandchild is on your knee at home. Or when you're teaching that child at home instead of relying on uh, government education. Hear me and hear me well and know the Constitution. I wish Dr. Curtis Kane was here. We miss him very much. I have my little pocket Constitution right here. But folks, go home. It's grassroots. How many times have you heard that word today? Grassroots? Grassroots? It's in this book. Go home. And you know what? If we're going to help with the precinct project, start planning right now to go to your neighbors, the next street over, the next street over, knock on doors, say, hey, I understand you just moved in. I'm Ross Aldridge. I live over here, two streets over, on uh, Mockingbird Circle, okay? And I, I participate in politics. Are you registered to vote? Have you moved your registration? Most of them don't. Do you have an 18-year-old or somebody who's about to be 18? Let's get them registered. It's very simple. Get to know. Most of us know our neighbors in little communities. Tate County is just a couple little towns, and the rest of us rule, okay? We're on the ferry transit where I live in Rankin. But you know what? Like in DeSoto County in the 1st District, all those people moved in, and guess what's going on? A conservative revolution in rank, I mean, DeSoto County. It works. The coast is fairly transient. All right, but y'all got to get out there and get to know your neighbors. Okay? All right, my time is up. Again, thank you, Ms. Laura. Uh, with a little uh, Q&A very quickly here. Yes, sir? I have three. Three things. <coughs> What was the state trooper's name who uh, did that? And can we write to his superiors and complain about what he did? You, you, could, you could certainly write to Santa Cruz, who is head of Mississippi Highway Patrol, but I, I, I would say that I don't think that's where your complaint needs to go. What does it mean? I think your complaint needs to go to Governor Phil Bryant right. and Chairman Joe Nossif. All right, but what was the man's name? Because, well, there was about 60 of them there that day um, and I don't know specifically who he was but I, I will say that Michael that a number of people from around the state wrote letters and are still writing letters to the governor and to Joe Nossif and letting them know that we do not appreciate this um, uh, gro gross, gross abuse of taxpayer dollars for a private event it wasn't a public event um, for the overwhelming majority of the event, there were no public elected officials there, so the Highway Patrol, but they were on highway, they were on your dollar, and they were there to intimidate the P. And so that man only reacted when he was, it was basically like sicking the dogs, Ross. He was told. He wasn't going in there to do it. He was just told, and he was told by Joe Nossif. But, and, and Phil definitely needs to because, I mean, uh, I will tell you that even from within the establishment, a lot of pressure was put on the governor to not allow Joe Nossif to chair the convention because they don't like Joe, even within the establishment. Um, but, but Phil was adamant that Joe's going to stay and he's going to remain. So that's where your letters should go. 
Oh, and I'll give you the addresses before you leave today, yes, Phil and Joe. One, one second item. Joe Nosif called somebody in attendance, a delegate, a state delegate from Jones County, County I believe. A cowardly little man. Now, what place does that have in a cowardly little, little man. man? That has no place in Republicans talking to each other like that. That shouldn't be that. Right. And that was reported in the Laurel paper, too, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I spoke that was to that man. That was at Jones County Republican Women's meeting about two weeks before the college. Yes, and your third? And number three, why cannot this group or a number of groups come together and form a committee and make a pamphlet or a booklet that shows how the, how the caucus is operated and then make a a video of it sometimes and avoid uh, somebody's picture being put in it and everything. Maybe it could be some kind of cartoon that we could pay to have done and be buried and give it to everybody and everyone in the counties. All right. We can have a committee where this could be done. And also, each time every year when we meet here, we could have a workshop to go through the process and let everybody come, charge the same price. If more people will want to get involved, you'll draw, you'll have the money to do whatever needs to be done. And you just read our mind, Ms. Melanie can tell you exactly about that right now. Ross, I was going to say uh, 30, 30 seconds. Um, we, we absolutely are planning to do that, Michael. As a matter of fact, when there was a group of, I don't know, 40, 50 plus of us that met after the state convention that afternoon to kind of debrief and talk about how the day went. And of that group, everyone and others around the state have reached out and said, please, let's get organized now. For So everybody kind of said, hey, let's take six weeks or so to catch our breath. Um, and then we're going to, so we're, we're already in the process of pulling together kind of a planning group to do just that, Michael, to work on. And we plan to meet probably quarterly over the next several years and meet in conjunction with other conservative groups that are active within the state. So you will absolutely be getting information on this before the fall of the year rolls around. Absolutely. One, one final thing, Mr. Alden. You had asked about a definition of conservative. If we could make one, uh, if we're Christians, then a conservative government or a conservative view of government is part of the Christian worldview. And so that would be the foundation. Amen. Uh, so we're all on the same page, except mm -hmm. for those who are public. Yes. We know that. Thank you very much. Yes, Ms. Pat. Just one thing. Oh, did we turn it off again? Yeah. All right, one thing real quick. I did a, a for lack of a better word, cheat sheet for DeSoto County because their precinct caucuses uh, were going to be contentious. I'll be glad to share that with y'all. And uh, secondly, uh, the chair, Joe's, Joe Nosef, Nosef showed up at uh, DeSoto County. I happened to go to that meeting and someone asked him about a statement he had made at one of their prior conversations and his answer was, if you don't have me videotaped or recorded, then I didn't say it. So I would advise any and all of you, if you engage in conversation with that person, that you video and or record it, because otherwise it didn't happen. Indeed, and I want to emphasize that because it's, I've seen it pay off in the uh, past. Anytime you go to any meetings like that, if you go and hear Joe Nossa when he comes to speak to the Panola County uh, GOP or the ranking uh, Republican women, Take your phone and record it, record it, record it. It's undeniable after that. And then some people are, are say, no, he's going to deny it. Yes, sir. I, I sit on the Noble County Executive Committee board. Uh -huh. He ain't coming from Noble County. <laughs> he's not coming to Adams County either. Yeah. He, he, we don't even welcome his phone call. Ross, real quick, I want to ask the group, is, is everyone in here or anyone in here aware of what happened to DeSoto County at the state convention in terms of the seating of their delegates or their alternates. I want to share this with you real quick because it's not wide known and we've reached out to over a hundred media outlets in this state and not one will, they've I mean they've gotten our information, they've acknowledged that they've gotten it but they will not talk about it. The Republican Party went to great lengths 
to tell us, and they give us all of this form work and this paperwork that you must fill out. DeSoto County elected their delegates. They voted and they ranked their delegates according to their votes. So they have 16 delegates. Well, then they had 16 alternates. Their 16 alternates they placed according to their votes, how many votes they received. Well, the first and the second and the third alternates were very conservative alternates. They submit that paperwork to the state. Well, when, when we got to the state, um, lo and behold, one of their establishment delegates did not show up. So we were really excited because now that meant that the next person coming up was a conservative. We were going to have the majority of DeSoto County. They didn't seat the conservative. They sat someone else. Lo and behold, they actually sat two others. So it was challenged and taken to the credentials table where they gave us a printout and said, well, here's how we have them listed. Here's your 16 delegates and here's your 16 alternates. They had taken all of the conservatives and put them at the bottom and they had put all the establishment alternates at the top. And we challenged them multiple times and asked them, where did you get this? And they said, well, the committee met and that's, I said, what did you base it on? Well, the paperwork that came from the county. No, we've already showed you the paperwork from the county. Well, our people didn't see that. Funny thing is, is we actually had a picture of the establishment chairman holding it at the caucus that day. Yes, she had seen it. We also had an email from the current DeSoto County Chairman saying that she would do just about anything to make sure that first conservative didn't get seated. Well, he didn't get seated. Now, we've challenged this to the party. Michael, we wrote the governor. A dozen people have called the governor's office. He refuses to speak to anyone about it. We've talked, we've written it to Joe Nassif. We've written it to the past chairman. I think it was addressed to six people, not one person acknowledged. Now, you guys have seen on TV what they did in Iowa and what they did in Colorado. This, what they did in Colorado pales to what they did in DeSoto County. And not one member of the media, and I'll also tell you, I was in direct communications with three of our best friends from Breitbart News who said, this is massive. We've got to get it covered. And they never called me back. So I tell you because, you know, there's that old saying in politics, nobody likes to toot their own horn. Well, let me tell you something. If you're not tooting your own horn in this fiasco, you will get swept under the rug to die a lonely death alone. We have to tell this story. When I asked the past chairman, because the current chairman and the current chairman of the Credentials Committee never would give us the process by which that was done. When I asked the previous chairman who despises Joe Nassif and has been somewhat friendly to us, he said, Melanie, there's no written policy. There's no policy. We just do it however we want to do it. We make it up as we go. That's what you're up against, okay? I just want you to be aware that that happened. We're running out of time very quickly, so I apologize. Uh, folks, we got to move on. We have a special guest that's here from out of town to speak. One thing I want to do, a lot of times the people who work on these things uh, are not uh, thanked well enough. Miss Laura has been working hard on it, and Miss Sandra Inman for sure has been working hard. Y'all give them a round of applause. Don Martin is too, okay? Uh, Miss Melanie and I will be around for more details of what uh, we've just heard. Again, thank you, panel, for being here, and thank y'all also. There's one question I want to ask Melanie before uh, you leave the, the stage, Melanie. Uh, has anyone contacted the National Republican Party? Uh, Laura, that's a good question. I don't know that anybody is not aware of. I, I think that we should at least send it, send it to Ryan's previous and Morton Blackwell. Yes. And I think those two for sure, and anyone else that's on the National Committee, we know that the Barbers don't do anything about it. But they so just need to be aware. They, they need, need to, to be aware involved. that their Republican, their state Republican parties are not inclusive, and that's how they keep shutting down their quote-unquote big tent. I'll make sure we get that done. 